Welcome to Christ Chapel College, the college outreach of Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth, Texas. We hope everyone experiences what Jesus calls abundant life. So we unapologetically point to Him as the source of life and joy. If you're a college student in the Fort Worth area, we'd be stoked to connect with you. Find out more at ChristChapelCollege.org and on Instagram at Christ Chapel College. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors uh, here, and um, I'm excited to get to jump into Hebrews chapter 13 with you. So if you got a Bible, uh, find the last chapter in Hebrews. If you're new to us, we, uh, we really try to spend a lot of time in just books of the Bible. And so we actually started this book, chapter 1, verse 1. I think it was the second week of school back in the fall. And we've just kind of been working our way through it. And so we are now beginning the last chapter of Hebrews. Uh, I'm going to preach the first six verses, and then Nate's going to wrap it up next week with the rest of chapter 13. Um, and I'm excited. Hey, also, just a caveat, we say this every once in a while, but if you don't have a Bible, um, we love this thing, we preach from this thing, we believe in this thing, um, and so if you don't have a Bible, there's really some really generous people at Christ Chapel who have uh, donated a bunch of Bibles around the edges, so there's purple leather Bibles and then um, some black ESV Bibles, and so if you want one on your way out, just grab one, and we would love for you to have one as a gift uh, to you. Here's what you're going to see in chapter 13. <clears throat> um, one of the things that happens is it feels like what's about to happen is, is the sermon I'm about to preach and the text that we're about to study feels like these three very kind of disjointed um, uh, admonitions, right? Encouragements um, where our author is saying, hey, here's how you should live or here's how you should, you know, here's what you should stay away from. But they seem very disjointed. Um, and so even in the sermon, you're going to feel like, wow, we just changed big gears and now we changed back to a, a, a different gear. And here's what I think is happening in chapter 13 of Hebrews. Um, <clears throat> this book has been this incredible uh, narrative that the author has, through um, the Holy Spirit's power and inspiration, really laid out this incredible argument in, in 12 chapters. And I think really Hebrews peaks, it climaxes the argument that he's been making at the end of chapter 12, which Asher, I thought, so brilliantly got to unpack last week. This idea, um, really throughout the book, that Jesus is better. Right, that Jesus is the better Moses, that he's the better prophet, that Jesus is the better priest. All throughout 12 chapters, we've seen this idea that Jesus is the better covenant. And then even last week, functionally, that Jesus is the better mountain. Um, and that really this call, the author says, to choose Jesus, to follow Jesus, and really hold fast to Jesus and the grace that he has given you. Don't forget of this amazing um, Christ, this amazing king who's worth following. Hold on to your faith. And I really think the the book of Hebrews really climaxes at the end of chapter 12, and then we hit chapter 13, and it feels like this, like, list. Oh, and also do this. Oh, and then watch out for this. Oh, and hey, don't forget about this. And so you kind of see this almost laundry list of, honestly, obedience that I think comes from the last 12 chapters. Um, here's what it makes me think of. Um, Danielle and I, we have two boys, Charlie and Miles. They're actually here um, this morning. You'll see them running around. Charlie's wearing a TCU hoodie, go frogs. Yep. Um, and uh, I beat you to it. And, um, and so when, so he's an eight-year-old now, but when Charlie was newborn, right, it's our first kid and he's this precious thing and we're like, okay, how, what do we do with this thing? Um, I think it was probably about three or four months. Danielle can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was probably about three or four months. We were like, man, we've got to go on a date. Like we've just got to get out of the house. Our whole world is revolved around this awesome, but crying needy kid, right? Just always crying, always wanting something, pooping his pants, that kind of stuff. We're like, we got to go on a date. And so we got family to come and babysit Charlie for the first time. And I, I, I still remember this. I remember our old house. I remember where we were and we were leaving our son for the first time not, you know, there's neither his mom or his dad are going to be with him. We're both getting in a car and leaving him. And it was with like family who were like there at the hospital and, you know, know him and have been around him pretty much most of the days of his little three or four month existence. And, and they already helped and they'd gotten bottles ready and helped change diapers. But it was in the final cup, like literally the last 90 seconds walking out of that door. It was like Danielle and I were like, oh, wait, and also this. Oh, yeah, and don't forget about this. Oh, and if you don't have the stuffed animal, he's not going to sleep. And oh, and don't forget about this. And whenever you do the diaper thing and, and heat up the milk to this degree. And it was this really, I think, come from a really loving parental place of a loving, of loving parents who, as they are wrapping and walking out the door, are saying, wait, there's a couple more really important things that we want you to know. And that's what it feels as I got to study this chapter. It feels like 
This is chapter 13, a loving parent saying, hey, here's some other things I want you to remember. I want you to do. I want you to stay away from some warnings, some encouragements. And so that's what we're going to see. And you're going to see that throughout this chapter. And so I want that to kind of be the theme that ties what feels like these very non sequitur, disconnected ideas together. And the second thing I need you to realize is this. Um, Before we jump into verse one of chapter 13, Maybe this is your first time with us, right? Or you haven't been around us in the last few weeks and you're just popping in. And if somebody were to just pop into just chapter 13 to kind of see what is really this list of what obedience should look like, what an obedient Christ follower, you should do this, you should not do this. If that's all you read, it would really give you the perception that Christianity is really just following some rules, Right? Christianity is really just the outflow of doing a bunch of things to be obedient to, to God. And I think it's really important that as we preach chapter 13 over the next couple of weeks, we keep it in context of the last 12 chapters, which were full of the gospel of grace, a God who has purchased us, a God who not by any works of our own, by not us keeping the list, by not us being obedient, by not us doing the right things and staying away from the wrong things, we see for 12 chapters a God who said, because of Christ's grace, you can now approach. You can now draw near and you can approach the throne, not because you did a bunch of stuff that I'm now mentioning in chapter 13, but because Christ is gracious and what he did is powerful enough for you to now have a relationship. And then chapter 13 comes out of a response. Obedience in our life should be a response to the relationship we have with the Almighty God, not the list of things we're doing to try to earn a relationship. It's really important that we keep that in context as we study uh, this chapter. Christianity is not earned by obedience to a list. It's earned by a perfect Savior who hung on a cross for us. And for those who have put their faith in Him and surrendered their life, then we get adopted as His We're his sons, we're his daughters. And then we get to live our life in response to that crazy, awesome grace. Chapter 13, verse one, look what it says. Let brotherly love continue. Just right off the bat, I love verse one and how he just has really said this idea of let let brotherly or even let brotherly and sisterly love continue. This is how he's beginning his like list of don't forget to do these really important things and stay away from these things. He's saying, hey, let love continue brotherly, familial love continue. And he gets even more specific in verse two, kind of zooming in on, okay, what, what, what should this love look like? Look at verse two. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. First note, I think we should all start saying the word unawares more. I think that should just be a thing that we just make popular again. Think about it, journal about it, pray about it. I feel like, hey, there's a Super Bowl party. Don't be unawares. Wouldn't that be cool if that was just us? No? All right, cool. <clears throat> I think it's a dumb idea. Yeah, I didn't like it. Um, <clears throat> here's what, I don't know why it says it that way. Um, here's, here's what it's saying. And even this idea of like, you might be uh, entertaining angels, that's actually referenced to in the Old Testament a couple of times. There's a guy named Lot. There's a guy named Abraham. Both of them were incredibly hospitable. There were these strangers who showed up. They were like, yeah, come on in, eat with my family, sit at the table. And they ended up being angels. It was this whole thing. The point is not, um, in honestly, scripture and certainly here, the point is not be nice to people because it could be they're actually an angel and then you get some sort of bonus prize. Um, really, there's a theme throughout scripture of how we're to be hospitable. And so this kind of first point that chapter 13, I think is making this application, obedience for us is this. If you're a follower in Christ, it's be hospitable, right? The argument is clear, be hospitable. And we're really defining that and biblically this idea of loving strangers and friends or even family, brothers and sisters, like loving them alike. So be hospitable means this idea that I love a stranger the same way I would with my brother or my best friend that the world shouldn't really be able to tell the difference who's important, who's valuable to me, because that's what Christ's like. That's what obedient hospitality should look like. And that's, that is a radical idea. I mean, that is just radically extreme to be able to love outsiders like that, because it's not just saying be benevolent, right? Like if you see somebody in your class who's really struggling, okay, I'm going to throw them a bone or I'm going to help them a little bit. No, no, it's saying really love them. Like the same way that if there's somebody in your life who you don't really know that well, 
and you see they've got a problem or you see they're hurting or you see they have a need that you would interact and maybe you don't even know that person's name or maybe you know their name and that's all you know about them that you would react the same way to that person as you would one of your best friends if you saw her need or his need that you'd step into it with that kind of zeal with that kind of brotherly sisterly love and that's radical Loving outsiders like that. I think verse three also helps um, to kind of give some detail to this idea, kind of zooming in on what hospitality looks like. Um, I think it could be a standalone point in and of itself, but I love how there's certainly these outsiders mentioned in verse three. Look at this. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. And, and this is a reference, uh, I would say, in chapter 10 of Hebrews, we actually hear that some have been thrown in prison and their goods taken away from them because they were messengers of Jesus. And so we think now here in chapter 13, he's saying, hey, man, even those people who for Christ, who were pursuing Christ, and they really got marginalized and persecuted, and man, remember them. And don't just remember them and write them a letter. Remember them as if they were your arm. They're a part of your body. Remember the outsider. Remember the person on the fringe. Love them. Shouldn't be a distinction between a stranger and a brother and a friend. Why? Why do we do that? I think largely because it points to this idea of how we glorify God and how we um, show the world around us and point to the gospel. Leviticus. I'm going to take you to the Old Testament to help answer this question why. Leviticus is um, in the Old Testament. It's a I mean, talk about rules. The Old Testament, uh, those Hebrews who were following God, our God, um, they had this book of law. And like, here's all the things you've got to do, right? And it was really down to the nuanced thing. Uh, every little thing of following the law was kind of in this book. And so chapter 19, verse 33 and 34, look at one of these laws. We'll throw it up on the screen for you. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, so a stranger starts kind of traveling along with you, in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And he stamps it, I am the Lord, your God. Hospitality is this core part of what it means to follow Christ. With the idea of hospitality, if you are a follower of Christ, there is inherently within this following of Jesus, there should be this response of how we love other people, how we're hospitable, how we include and invite other people into our life. Uh, look at what Jesus says that ties to this idea of hospitality and how big of a deal Jesus makes hospitality. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. This is a long little section here, but read along. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goat. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Just get the picture here. So what's happening is the God of the universe, this is, uh, this is alluding to the idea of God, finally, the king, Jesus, standing at the end of time, separating, these are mine, these are not mine. Separating the sheep, which are his, to the goats who are not his. This is, a, this is an ominous, amazing day that it's alluding to. But look at this. <clears throat> then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Wow, this is big news. You get in, you're in. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. So he's saying, hey, you are mine. You are my kids. Come and, and you cared for me. You treated me not as a stranger, but you were hospitable to me. And look at what those who are getting invited in, look at their honest re reply. I love this. They're like, hey, not that I'm not grateful, but this is what they say. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you, talking about Jesus the King, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Right, they're saying, I appreciate that you're letting us in, but I don't, I don't actually tangibly remember 
helping you specifically. When did that happen exactly? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you and listen to Jesus' answer? Verse 40, the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Hospitality is a part of the Christian life. It should come out of the Christian, right? Who is rooted in Christ, who who is bought and purchased and adopted as a son or daughter. Hospitality, loving people, loving those in the margins, loving strangers, loving them the way Christ has called us to from the beginning. Everyone who follows them, I want you to be hospitable. Is this radical call. And so if you are a Christian, hospitality is not just for someone else to do. If you say you're following Jesus and aren't loving those on the outside, aren't seeing those on the outside, you're missing a huge aspect of what you've been called to be a part of. Man, I love the thought of what hospitality looks like in your life. And I hear stories of it all the time. Man, we have meetings where we'll just get to tell stories of cool life change and things that are happening and and stories of either college students or young adults who are just getting their lives just wrecked with cool God stuff. And, and it's usually because other college students are getting to introduce them to sweet community or, or love them in ways that uh, we as a staff would never have been able to give access to. So I want you to really ask yourself the question, how do you do this? As a young adult, as a college student, what does this look like? Who in your life, who in your life is on the outside that you need to love, that you need to be hospitable? That who, is, who are the strangers in your life? And maybe you need to start with, God, I don't even know if I'm seeing them. And maybe your prayer this next week, not maybe, make your prayer this next week. God, would you help me see people that I didn't even see before? Have the eyes that you have. See the person who's lonely. See the person who's alone. No strings attached. Give me the heart. Give me the courage to just love them like I would a best friend, like I would a brother. That reeks of Jesus community that's loving people that way, man, I get so fired up. What happens if this community goes back out there and loves people the way we've been loved? Not that we just muster up and people are like, wow, those people are really nice. No, 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 that it's, God, there's something about their God. Why do they care about me? And why do they serve? And why are they so hospitable to me? so that they see our good works and they glorify our Father who is in heaven. That's our role. Who in your life do you need to love? Do you need to be hospitable for? There's so many people that's hard to do that with. And if you're like, oh man, God, please don't say this person. Please don't say this person. He's saying that person, man. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and put that one out there. Okay, watch me pivot now to the second totally dis- disconnected point. We're now going to talk about sex, okay? Verse four, <clears throat> verse four. He's going to now bring up this second admonition, right? He says, let marriage be held in honor among you and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterers, um, the adulteress. <clears throat> Here's what our author is saying. Um, he, he is holding up this idea of, hey, as he's kind of walking out the door in Hebrews, he's saying, hey, be hospitable. But then he's also saying, hey, respect the gift of sex, Respect it. Respect what marriage is um, and respect the gift of sex. Um, We see this idea of honoring and respecting um, sex is this good and God-designed thing, right? It's this good and a God-designed thing. We see all throughout the Bible um, it talked about, right? We see in 1 Corinthians, Paul is pretty clear. Um, he, he has this whole admonition Paul does to say, hey, husbands, um, give it up for your wife. Wife, give it up for your husband, right? There's a pretty bold claim in there that you're like, oh man, cool. A lot of like, you know, a lot of like grooms put that on t-shirts for their honeymoon and same thing with brides. Um, we also see Song of Solomon, which is an entire book, um, dedicated to this idea of romance between a husband and wife in this really God-glorifying way. Uh, Song of Solomon in the Old Testament, um, many scholars acknowledge that back in the day, Jewish boys weren't allowed to read that book in the Bible until they were 13, right? Because of just how steamy it is. 
God created sex. That's a gift that God designed. God created sex and, and all of the other sexual things that God designed, that's, that's his. And somewhere along the way, our culture has hijacked that, right? Somewhere along the way, our culture has hijacked that and, and perverted it. And also, somehow, they brilliantly managed to then make God look like the killjoy. To then make the church look like, oh man, the church doesn't want you to enjoy awesome sex stuff and so that's the worldly thing. And then the church kind of got quiet about it. It's like, oh, it could be awkward. We don't want to talk about it. But it's God built it. God created it. It's good. It's good. It's his design. He invented it. But he invented it for a purpose, right? It, it's for a purpose. It's a tool in marriage. Um, and it's specifically designed to be a tool in marriage. Sex is the thing that God designed that creates intimacy, unlike anything else in all of creation. This is something that God created so that a couple can experience intimacy in the context of a marriage. Here's why that's important. Um, let me talk just real briefly about marriage for a second. We pray for you guys all the time. We really do. Um, we pray for you as a staff all the time. Um, and one of the things that I pray for you guys every once in a while about is if God gives you marriages, right? And it's been cool being, uh, being around young adults and college um, age people for a decade. I've gotten to walk with a lot of people and officiate a lot of weddings and, you know, go meet a lot of babies whenever they start having babies, um, all that kind of fun stuff. One of the things I pray for you guys, though, is your marriages. If God wills it, that you would have these really sweet marriages. I want that for you, man, because I know how big of a deal that is, um, how God designed that, um, how, how sweet and how worshipful a really great, healthy marriage can be. All of that. want that for you. But when you have uh, a marriage, if you get married one day, um, I'm not rooting that that marriage is just really based on this foundation of chemistry or compatibility or attraction. All of those things, great. I want them for you, that's swell, but that's wallpaper of the house. And the marriage that we are called to have, that we pray for, that I pray for my boys and I pray for you guys is a marriage built on a covenant of love, right? That it's not just love that's this arbitrary word that kind of gets defined really however we want it to in any given season. And, and maybe I love somebody because, man, the attraction is there. Or maybe I love them because I feel something that's there. Or, or it's this, this mysterious chemistry that's there. And so that chemistry must mean love. All of those things will change and all of those things will lie to you, guys. They will all lie to you. Chemistry and compatibility and attraction, those lie to you. But covenant love is this thing that Christian marriages, that God designed marriages to be based on, which is this idea of I am all in. I'm not half and half. It's not a contract. It's I'm all in. It means the most romantic thing I can say ultimately in my marriage is I cannot wait until she is old and wrinkly and saggy and I'm taking care of her and pushing her in a wheelchair and bathing her, whatever, plucking eyebrows that we didn't know she had, right? Like that. And honestly, vice versa. Like that's going to be me way quicker than it's her, right? But that is this incredible thing that we get and it's so sweet. Then it's so much deeper because it's I'm all in, in a covenant. There's nothing you can do, right? It's not 50-50. I'm all in. And that covenant, that choosing to love you, even when I don't feel like it on certain days or even when I don't have butterflies in my stomach. Man, can I tell you, when I first started dating Danielle, guys, I was a mess, man. I was gassy every time we had a date because my stomach would just tie up in knots when we were on a date. And I just was this gassy mess. And at the end of the date, I'd be all, you know, smooth. And then I'd just like crawl back to the car. Um, I mean, she just, she just knocked my socks off. I don't get butterflies, right? Tomorrow's Valentine's Day might be Chick-fil-A with our kids, right? Like that's the romance, right? But it is sweet and I wouldn't trade it for anything because I don't get the butterfly thing in the same way that I do. But my love for her and the love that we have is so much deeper than 23-year-old Ben version of love. And you would have talked to 23-year-old Ben version. I just would have floated around all the time when talking about her. But it's so much deeper and it's based on this covenant and it's sweet. 
because it's not going anywhere. Here's the thing. Sex is this incredible tool used to produce that kind of intimacy when it's in a covenant. It's a tool to produce intimacy in a covenant of marriage. It's an incredible thing. Um, But all the time, we take that outside of that context. We take it outside of the context. We use that tool. We use that thing that God designed outside of his design. I think the best illustration that I've heard is the idea that um, it's like fire in a fireplace, right? This incredible thing that you put a fire in a fireplace and it's a great thing, right? It gives warmth to the house and light and it's, it's, it's appropriate and it's, it's powerful and significant and affects you in, in positive ways. But if you were like, hey, let's start a fire and you do it on your couch, right? That would be bad. That would be a, a bad thing. Or it's like, hey, let's just start a fire on the rug in the kitchen. Then it would be a bad thing and it would spread everywhere. And so the idea that like, man, what has God designed it and how has he designed it to function? Where has he designed it to function? And even verse four here, it's a marriage bed. The marriage bed is, is this idea. That's where it's supposed to take place is this incredible tool. Um, and that's, that's not just sex, right? That's all of the things that God has designed within sex to be a delight for a husband and wife. It's also pornography, um, which God hasn't designed, but it's our world taking these things that God designed and and perverting them and and making them so available to us. Look, I, it is not lost on me who, um, I get to, who I get to speak with. Let me tell you a little bit about my story briefly from the time I was a early teen right? Pornography became a part of my life. And, and that became this thing that I just struggled with all throughout the rest of, of my teen years and my early twenties. Um, I got married pretty young. Um, it was a, it was a thing that I remember feeling like I would get little moments of freedom and victory from it and really feel like, man, I'm so satisfied without that. And there's joy in my life and I've got freedom from that. And the chains of that, what felt like these chains were gone. And then the others, I just walk right back into and get feel stuck. Um, and I remember thinking too, well, when I get married, that will no longer be an issue. And then guess what? It was waiting for me on the other side of marriage too. Because pornography wasn't about me getting laid or not, right? Which now I have a wife. It wasn't about that. It was about this root sin issue where I get to be my own God and I get, I get to pursue what I want to pursue. And, and so, man, that was something that even followed me into my marriage. And I had to fight and kill that and confess that and, and create boundaries in my life. Can be honest, that's still something that I have to have boundaries in my life as a pastor. I have to have boundaries in my life. I can't trust myself. So I have people in my life who I know they're going to ask me about it. They're, they're going to hold me accountable. I don't want to put myself in a place where I could wander back into something that I know isn't God's design. Um, man, even, even aside from that, in, in our relationships, in Danielle's relationship, Danielle, uh, my wife, had a really hard relationship, um, really unhealthy relationship before we started dating. And a lot of that, those seeds got sown into um, her And so even when I started dating her, she was this amazing woman, but she just carried this big baggage of shame, feeling like, oh man, I didn't do it right, and I didn't didn't do what I was supposed to do. She just had all the shame walking into our relationship, and that's not who she is, and that's not who she was, and that didn't define her, but she was still carrying all of all of that shame. And even in my relationship and my leadership of her, man, and in dating and pursuing and engagement, I made a ton of mistakes in that. Here's why I tell you all those things. I don't tell you those things to be licensed um, for, for you to, to be able to stay stuck. I just tell you because, man, I, I believe in a God who restores and redeems. God designed this stuff in beautiful ways for his glory, and it's an incredible tool, and he wants to use it in a proper way. He wants to use it. He wants you to use it in a proper way, and he wants you to abstain from using it. If it's, if it's not yet. But man, when we get out of bounds, we also have this God who takes broken things and he restores them and he fixes them and he brings life where there was death. That's what our God is. That's what our God has done. And so if I'm speaking to you and you feel right now like you're stuck, you feel like right now you're like, man, I have already not, kept the marriage bed undefiled. I want you to hear this. The grace of God is bigger than that. I can also testify to watching him redeem broken people, including my wife. 
including me, who had plenty of reasons to say, well, I guess I'm disqualified. And he said, no, 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 no. I qualify you, not you, not your past. Hear that. Hear the grace of God. Hear a God who, even when we don't fit in his design, not as a license to stay out there, but to say there's something better, and I will restore, and I will redeem, and I will still give you what is beautiful. Follow me. That's amazing, guys. That's amazing. Be encouraged. Be challenged by God's word. He has a way he wants that gift of sex to function, but also be encouraged that if you feel stuck, if you feel like you've already, you've already ruined it or you're stuck in a relationship, does that mean you have to break up with everything? Does that mean, it means you need to be wise. It means you need to trust him. It means you need to love his word more than what's just right in front of you. It means maybe you need to find some community and pull them in. Maybe you need to not be isolated with the things we struggle. And certainly, I know for me, man, when I'm isolated, it's dangerous. He takes broken things and he restores them. Praise God for that. My wife is a result of that. I'm a result of that. Our marriage is a result of that. And it's sweet. Don't carry on shame that God's already paid for. It's not a rule also, right? It's not, oh, I didn't follow the rule. It's not a rule, it's a design. And there's a real difference. This isn't a rule that you're breaking, that God's keeping a tally mark. It's a design that you're functioning outside of. And so repent and run back to the design that he has created there's this tension between functioning in our sin and in our brokenness and then also experiencing grace and restoration. 1 Corinthians 6, I'm going to briefly read this over you. It starts, starts pretty ominous, some bad news, but don't worry, there's a really good ending. Paul says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's pretty bad news. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, what we're talking about here, Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. I love that. I love that Paul said, hey, here's a whole list. And he doesn't rank them, right? All of it. You should be able to find yourself probably in multiple spots up here. I know I can, right? Multiple spots. And he doesn't rank sin. He just says, hey, our sin disqualifies us. It disqualifies us. We can't enter because of our sin, because of our brokenness. Verse 11, look what it says. And such were some of you. Amen. Such were some of us, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of God. Guys, you've been made a new creation if you're in Christ. His grace extends no matter how far you've wandered. His design. And if you're here and you don't necessarily feel bad about that, maybe it's not that you came in here and you're like, yeah, I know I'm stuck in this thing. I know I don't like it. I know I'm not proud of it. I'm trying to walk out of it. I want you to hear grace. But maybe you're here and you think, I don't know that I really want to. I, I'm kind of enjoying it. I'm not there yet. Right? I don't know that I believe his design because this is fun. Because what God created is really good. It will eventually create toxic things. That tool used in relationships that aren't covenant relationships will eventually just get toxic. But maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you haven't experienced that yet and you're still just having fun with that. My encouragement to you, one, I'm glad you're here. I really am. There's no, I'm not judging you. You're not gonna get picked on or bullied. I love that you're here, but I wanna challenge you, keep investigating. Keep investigating his design for your life, not just in this area, but in all areas. And the last one is this. Last one, and this will be quick. Last admonition, number three in chapter 13 is this. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. Um, here's what we see. A challenge to pursue contentment and reject greed. Right, so he, he, we've seen these three things, right? The author was like, hey, be hospitable. And then he was like, man, respect this amazing gift of sex and, and keep the marriage bed pure and keep things in the right place. And then he says, and also on my way out, then I want you to pursue contentment and reject greed. Um, the idea of rejecting greed, money is not evil, right? Money is not inherently evil. Oftentimes scripture speaks against it, but it's always speaking against the love of money. When money becomes my hope, when money 
becomes my idol. And contentment is this powerful weapon, right? Are, are you always someone who wants more, who wants the new gadget, the upgrade, the new car, the new whatever? Um, and if that's, even if it's in the small ways, start now as a young adult to identify, man, I, I think I've got this thing that always feels like I want the next thing to, to really satisfy. And I'm never really satisfied. I'm never really content with what I have. And so really checking your heart. As the author of Hebrews is wrapping this book up, check your heart. Man, am I... Do I really love the things of the world or can I find sweet, sweet contentment? contentment? Um, man, I, being married uh, at a young age, we were broke as a joke, man. It was crazy and it was awesome um, and it was sweet and God gave us this sweet gift of contentment. I remember one time, just a quick story of just God's faithfulness um, in our contentment. We, um, we had some medical bills. We'd been married for a couple of years. We had some medical bills and it was like three grand and I was like, that's... I had like four years of salary. I don't know when I'll get three grand. Um, but I had a, this old car. Um, I'd gotten a, a newer used car, but I had this old car. The car that I was date, I dated Danielle was this old Jeep Grand Wagoneer with the wood panels. It was a junker, man. And I was like, I'll sell it, right? I'll sell it and we can pay these bills. <clears throat> and so I parked it in the front of our house and put a for sale sign and people would come. And it, like, you couldn't really get it started. It was a, it was a piece of junk. Um, and, and I was like, if I can get 1500 for it, that'll be like half the cost for these bills. And uh, I was like, man, if I could just get 1500 bucks and people would come and they'd be like, I'll give you $90 or like, I'll give you some Pokemon cards. I was like, what the heck, man? This is a joke. And I just couldn't get anybody to even come close to wanting to pay me $1,500 for that thing. And no joke, I was out of town one day and I, I, for some crazy reason, a guy lost control of his car on my street, swerved up into my yard and then swerved back into my car in between a tree in the parkway and my car and just <laughs> scraped up my car. Um, and it was like, what in the world happened? And he like, you know, ripped off his bumper and he landed in his car broken in my, my neighbor's driveway. And we were like, what? Insurance company, long story short, came and they were like, hey, your car's totaled. And I was like, yeah, and it was only worth $90. So I figured it was totaled. And they gave us a check for three grand for that car. And I was like, get out of here. So we just partied. No, I'm just kidding. We spent them on medical bills. Here, here's why I tell you that story. I just tell you that story to encourage you, honestly, um, as an older brother, as a pastor in your life. Man, as you just, the weapon of contentment, pursuing God, and this idea that the Lord's got you. Look at how this passage ends, right? It's a quote from Psalm 118. This is what we're going to end with. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord's got me. I can be content What's man going to do to me? And that's for all of these things. That's for the fear of man that would drive me to not be hospitable, to say, I don't want to be hospitable because I'm going to get rejected. They're going to think I'm weird. It's going to come across wrong. That fear of man that I could say, what's man going to do to me? The Lord is my helper. The fear of not compromising maybe sexually or in a relationship because I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be that weird girl or weird guy. I got to fit in. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be unaccepted. I want to go along with it that, that you would say, man, could I have contentment and trust the Lord that with your resources, with your time, with your future, that we would be people who point to the Lord and say, he is my helper. I'm going to find my contentment in him. I'm going to pursue what he has for me. And that all of that comes as a response to say, I have a father who loves me. And so all of this obedience comes from a place of God, thank you for how you love me would my life now respond to where we could be people who say, you alone, God, are the one I trust. You alone are the one I trust. And we could be people who say, God, you're holy. And the world around us could see us and say, man, who is that God that they praise? Let's go back into a time of worship. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you. Thank you for how you love us. Um, I mean that, God. You love us so well, God. We we say we love you, um, but our ability to love you just comes as, a, as an echo from how you have already loved us so perfectly. And so, God, we want to experience that more. We want to see that more. Um, for my brothers and sisters in this room, Lord, any of these areas, God, would you just continue to convict us? Um, in your sweet kindness, would you show us, God, how we could be hospitable in ways that just bring you glory? How we could treat the, the things that you have designed um, in sex and sexuality in ways that bring you glory, God. Um, and then, Father, even with our resources and with our time, would we put you first? Where we live our lives in a way 
that people would look and not say what a bunch of great Christians, but they would say, wow, that is a God worth worshiping. Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us. In the name of Jesus, amen.